All right, I think that we will go ahead and get started. Happy hump day, everybody. My name is Paula Thornton Greer. I'm Senior Vice President of External Affairs and Reputation Management for Planned Parenthood Illinois Action, which is the advocacy and the political arm of Planned Parenthood of Illinois. Um, it's really good. I've been longing for company. It is so good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, there was a profound need to connect before what is sure to be one heck of an evening. Um, our country faces just important challenges now and in the years ahead. And as I say that, I can't help but think what an understatement that is. Tonight's debate between Pence and Kamala will be arguably one of the most important of its kind since VP debates started, and Delmarie can correct me if I am wrong, <laughs> but about 40 years ago. Um, for more reasons than we have to list during this hour, lunch hour together. Uh, this is a time of profound discord and uncertainty, but within that there is hope. And I also think that without question for me, the framework of this election is intersectional. It's a, a framework of reality that if applied with intentionality, if the people in the administration have the intention that it will allow us to tackle problems from whether it's reproductive rights, health equity, educational equity, economic justice, gender justice, racial justice, you name it. So much more that we'll really be able to do that. So I'm excited. I'm charged. I ask you that you don't hold back. We're, we're gearing up for what I think will be a couple of really good threads of conversations. We have um, three terrific people that are going to help lead the conversation strands. Pretend that we're sitting around a large table, that we're breaking bread together, that we're sipping a little tea or whatever your favorite beverage may be. Um, and let's talk about how we together can help elevate these issues that we care about and the actions that we can take, you know, before, during, and after the debate to make sure that we can make a difference during what my colleagues like to call not election day, but the election season. So again, we'll have three conversations led by three terrific people, all of whom are looking forward to leading you in a really interactive conversation. So please be vocal. Your voices and your participation are wanted and necessary. Um, don't forget to use the chat to insert your questions and we'll be monitoring those. So please fill the chat with questions and comments. I want to take a moment just to thank Delmarie Cobb, who's the founder of Ida's Legacy. You will hear from her shortly, who reached out to PPIA to get this started, who knew that we were both committed to um, to moving this conversation forward um, around this important time. And then we thought, hmm, who else can we call? <laughs> and that is when we reached out to the person that I am so proud to turn this over to, Karen Freeman Wilson, who is the president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. And I will just say, once a leaguer, always a leaguer. Over to you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Paula, and thank you for your uh, past, present, and future dedication to the Chicago Urban League. It is such an honor to partner with Planned Parenthood of Illinois, and I want to thank you and Ms. Del Marie for thinking of the Chicago Urban League and, and of me for joining you in what we all know to be an important conversation about the election season, but also about not just the presidential election, but the down ballot races. Uh, I'm also eager to hear your panelists, particularly our impact fellow, Nick Cummings. Uh, the Chicago Urban League has existed and fought on behalf of Chicago residents for over 100 years for racial justice and economic equity. And as we have seen 2020 unfold, that fight, that effort is now more important than ever. And 
that is why I would say this upcoming election is so important to all of us. Whether um, you are like us in your research and advocacy effort, um, your programming efforts and reprogram in the areas of entrepreneurship, housing, youth services and education, in uh, leadership development and in workforce development, whether you are in any of those areas or areas of your own like reproductive justice and other issues like immigration, which are so important to all of us, we know that this election is important. Um, I am particularly excited about the historic nature of the debate tonight as we see the first African American woman uh, to set, take the vice presidential stage along with Vice President Pence to uh, talk about the issues that are so near and dear to our hearts. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is happening in the midst of a, a dual pandemic, that of COVID-19 and that of a cry around this nation, quite frankly, around this world for uh, racial justice. And so um, we have our work cut out for us in what is less than 30 days until the presidential election. Um, the early voting has already started in Chicago, in many places around the country. And um, I would just say to each and every one of us, make sure that you are doing all that you can to ensure a record turnout in our community. And so with that, I am excited to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, the person whose brainchild this <laughs> prep session was, someone who is uh, an iconic political and media consultant, and one who I am uh, glad to count as a friend and colleague uh, Ms. Delma Ray Cobb. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate it. And hello, and thank you, Karen, and thank you, Paula, for including Ida's legacy in our lead up off program to tonight's vice presidential debate. And I think you, you two have set the stage very well for what we're going to do this afternoon and for the expectation in these next 28 days. The Ida B. Wells Legacy Committee is the state's first political action committee focused on Black women candidates. We're proud to join Planned Parenthood Illinois Action and the Chicago Urban League in hosting this important panel that we hope will motivate more people to encourage their friends and family to register and vote in what may be the most important election of our lifetime. We keep saying that, but I think this time we, it really is. We have a great panel joining us in our lunchtime discussion and we will lead our inter and they will lead our interactive conversation. They are Nicholas Cummings from the Chicago Urban League, Rose Colasino from Indivisible Illinois, and Spencer Dolan of Planned Parenthood Illinois Action. And welcome all three of you and Nicholas, I'm gonna let you go first. Thank you very much, Delmarie. I'm Nicholas Cummings. I am a recent graduate of the Chicago Urban League's Impact Leadership Development Program, which is a collaboration between Chicago Booth and the Chicago Urban League. It is a program developed to help train up uh, Black leaders here in the city of Chicago, and I'm honored to be part of this panel. Uh, Karen mentioned down ballot races also being important, and I should mention that I am the immediate past chair of the Judicial Evaluation Committee for the Cook County Bar Association, which is the oldest bar association of black lawyers in the country. Uh, so our first question that I've been teed up to uh, discuss this afternoon is, um, I'd like to ask our participants what they feel are COVID-19's impact on communities of color. Now you should see a poll here with options to select. 
And if you don't see an answer that you feel uh, uh, is appropriate, you feel free to put it in the chat for us. Um, so I can see the results streaming in. It's very interesting. About 30% of you have uh, voted. So don't be shy. Go ahead and, and cast your, uh, your vote. And I, I'd like to uh, especially recognize my fellow Impact alum, Mr. Kelly Fox, as well as Mavis Lang, the Executive Director of the Impact Leadership Development Program, who I've seen in the uh, as participants. So shameless plug for the Chicago Urban League's Impact Leadership Development Program. All right, um, we're almost there. We got 75% of the vote. So if you have uh, something else, we do have one response here in the chat. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and stop the poll and then we can go ahead and discuss the answers. All right, so, so far the, the poll results, the most impacted uh, area was employment and the economy followed by access to healthcare and rounding out education. We had one, uh, response in the chat that specifically mentioned mental health. All of those are definitely important. Um, and as you can imagine, all of these are, uh, are related. Um, the Chicago Urban League put out a white paper in May titled An Impact, I'm sorry, An Epidemic of Inequalities. And as we know from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Black Chicagoans specifically um, made up a tremendous or a larger share of our workers that are considered essential workers. So more than a quarter of healthcare support workers were black, uh, approximately 23% um, of respiratory therapists were black, uh, and license, licensed vocational nur nurses, about a third, almost a third of those are black. So we know that um, while these people remained employed because they were considered essential, uh, they were also put at greater risk of infection. Additionally, there were a lot of people who lost work. So we have a lot of uh, our restaurant tour work, or restaurant workers, uh, and and service workers in our in our mainly a service economy who are individuals of color, and so they did experience a large impact to uh, their employment in, in the economy. Um, but one of the things that I'm we were we we discussed previously before the program today was the impact on education, and I'm surprised that it came in third. Education has been impacted like never before, not only because we have people that are now homeschooling or learning from home, but we now understand that internet access is more of a utility and not a uh, uh, luxury as once imagined. It, it's more so akin to the home landline that we used to have, uh, electricity, uh, gas. It, it's so essential now, especially when you talk about kids needing to learn. And there is a very real digital divide in the Chicago, in Chicagoland area alone. There was a study done that talks about how the South and West sides don't have access to, to broadband internet. Uh, that inability to, to have access to broadband internet, never, never mind devices to access that broadband internet, stifles the learning of black children in the South and West sides of Chicago. So those are some serious intersectionality issues that we hope that that the candidates will bring up in the debate is it's not as, as uh, Karen Freeman um, Wilson suggested, we are battling two pandemics, one that's been going on for nearly 400 years and another that just came to light in 2020. So hopefully those, those, those intersectionalities will come up uh, tonight from our candidates as they debate on the national stage. So I think yeah. the next person let me move the poll here. The next person to talk will be Spencer to uh, discuss, Spencer Dolan to discuss uh, the future of reproductive rights. Spencer? Yeah, I think we can also probably um, maybe throw this to the, the group as well and see if anyone has any thoughts they wanted to, to um, add to that, Nicholas. I, I, when, I, when I was looking at this, I thought about how um, potentially some of these things could be compounded, right? Like, like it's not just one thing. It's not like you potentially lose your job. So those economic factors are involved and then your housing is in jeopardy or 
um, you know, it, it just seems like all interconnected for me. So when I was kind of looking through this, I was thinking, you know, these compounding factors make the, the two, you know, different um, parts of this issue you were talking about even, even harder, um, you know, that it's, it's really not just going to be one thing, um, you know, or, or maybe you still have your job, but um, you, your child is um, uh, doing e-learning and you don't have great access for them for Wi-Fi or you don't have the childcare you need, right? Um, or you're afraid to, to bring them into childcare. Maybe it was a parent of yours or something like that and, and they, they can't risk it because of healthcare and they're worried about what their access is gonna look like if they get sick, right? So all these things kind of seem to swirl around for me and um, you, you I didn't know a, if anyone else. Yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. You raise an interesting point, Spencer, that I that I am highly confident should come up in tonight's debate. And that's the United States is one of the few countries where our health care is tied to our employment. Yes. So if you lose your employment, you lose your health care and the access to health care becomes a, uh, a problem, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, so that is a very serious issue that you raise and, and um, I expect that this will come up with res with respect to one party wanting to push sort of a, a national healthcare initiative that uh, makes healthcare fundamental as a right, and another party that says, "No, we should su we should support the private uh, healthcare industry, which is typically tied to your employment status." Um, there is a yeah. question that uh, that asks, "Have the vice presidential candidates been talking about this, and to what degree?" Um, we do know that the Democratic nominee for vice president was talked about it during her run as president or when she was running for the Democratic nomination. Um, we haven't really heard much from them as vice presidential nominees, but we do know that the platform for one party is to ensure that more Americans have access to health care while the other party uh, would like to tie it specifically to uh, private industry to, to help uh, privatize and profit. Uh, off of healthcare costs. You Anybody else have any other room? questions? Yeah. yeah, don't don't be shy and and I don't know if um our or Paula or Karen uh, or even Del Marie want to uh, chime in on this particular topic as well since since you guys have joined us. Well, it's certainly at stake. Um, the healthcare issue is at stake when you look at the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is very much in the limelight at this point. So that's a big issue. And I think uh, what we saw in 2016 is many people did not understand that the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare were the same thing. And so where they, res they, re they hated Obamacare simply because it was Obama, um, what, once they realized, wait a minute, the Affordable Care Act is Obamacare. And when we're talking about pre-existing conditions and taking away my insurance, that means, oh my God, I won't have any insurance and I have a pre-existing condition, which a majority of people have. And so I think that's in the spotlight right now as we have a president who is rushing to get a nominee, uh, his nominee on the Supreme Court who will definitely uh, tilt the uh, Supreme Court. Yeah, Delmarie, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, you know, and one of the questions that I often hear from young people in my life is what, number one, they don't understand, they don't understand how to connect the past with the present, right? And we were talking about that a little bit earlier. So they don't understand the connection between what's happening with the Supreme Court and the Affordable Care Act and how it impacts them with their their job or the job that they hope to have. And so they're a little unsure about uh, how to, they're sort of on the fence about how do I continue to raise this up because the election's about to happen. So for young people specifically, young professionals who are maybe new to the workforce, what, what resources would you recommend that they um, take in in order to gain a better understanding and connect that past which we can't forget, to the present situation that we're in. Well, one of the things I, I say all the time is that you really have to read everything. And uh, I don't get my information from just one source. I try to read as much as I can so that I can then distill the information from all these sources. 
but certainly we need to read uh, black newspapers. And oftentimes those, even if it's online, it doesn't matter whether it's online or physical, physical newspaper, it's important to read it because I always say that whenever I go to a black media website, I see an issue that I've never seen in any of the other papers for that week. And so that's important for us to get a, a historical perspective on all of these issues. And a prime example is affirmative action. Why the Supreme Court is so important? Well, take affirmative action. Does anyone talk about affirmative action anymore? No, because we have watched the Supreme Court systematically dismantle it. And mm -hmm. who does affirmative action help? It was meant to help us. African Americans who have historically been uh, dis, uh, disinvested in our communities, disinvested in terms of our opportunities, and that was the whole purpose of it, to give us an even playing field, field. And certainly here we are 40 years later and we see that that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, it helps someone like me, you know, like a white, it helps women, um, you know, it, it's not what it, it's not um, doing what it was originally intended to do. And um, I don't think people understand that. Um, yeah, just, just another, another reason, um, and unless people have um, other ideas on this important topic, I think that might be a good segue into our next topic as well. Um, and I can introduce myself while the poll maybe launches. Um, my name is Spencer Dolan. Um, I am the exec chair of um, Future of Choice, a committee associated with Planned Parenthood Illinois Action. Um, and we do a lot of really amazing work in conjunction with PPIA um, to fundraise and uh, work towards different uh, electoral and advocacy goals. Um, you know, for example, last week we did a really fun trivia night um, with all the proceeds going to PPIA. Um, we've done phone banking for amazing candidates like um, uh, amazing campaigns like Lauren Underwood's campaign um, to try to get people to register for to vote, uh, one on the census, things like that. Um, so uh, just wanted to say I'm really excited for this discussion, what we've had so far, what we're going to have, and I'm even more excited about tonight. So um, the poll should be um, in your chat right now. Um, the question I can read aloud, which of the following topics are you most concerned about related to future SCOTUS decisions? We've kind of talked about a couple, right? Um, we talked a little bit about the ACA. I, I know that there's gonna be a challenge to that, I believe, like in November 10th, something like that, I believe we talked about. Um, so lots lots of things coming up. Um, maybe I'll give everyone some more time to vote on this. And yep, looks like the ACA is a big one. Just talked about that. Um, Oh, and um, thank you, Karen. Uh, oh, you saw, if anyone didn't see in the chat, remember that the census had been extended by, the, by court order 2-10-31. Um, I'm sure everyone on this lovely call has filled out their census, but it does take just a couple minutes if you haven't. Remember, they can't ask you, um, you're not, you, know, you don't have to worry about your um, status, right? Um, and uh, you should fill it out um, like based on your household. So um, it's, super, super important so that, you know, um, the, the area that you live in and, and, and your community can get the resources you need. Um, okay, so I think that we are probably pretty good on voting. Um, and it looks like the top one, oops, sorry, this just changed. Okay, um, looks like ACA and healthcare is first and then second reproductive rights. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking about this question, um, I was kind of like, first of all, the list could be even longer, right? We could add um, <laughs> so many more things to this. And also I'm worried about all of them, right? How do I just choose one? Because these are um, such, such crucial issues for all of us. And for me, what I was really um, thinking about just coming from kind of who I am and, and, and the, the work that, that I do um, in conjunction with PPIA, reproductive rights were very top of mind for me. 
Um, I'm really hoping that tonight um, in the debate, uh, reproductive rights are um, addressed by both candidates. Um, as we know, Mike Pence does not have uh, the best record on that. And, and a lot of these other um, lists here, like a lot of these other things in there. So I would love to see um, Kamala really go after him on some of these issues because I think it will be um, just so telling on, 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 his, um, on his record and things. Um, so I think most specifically, probably what I'm worried about with, you know, based on for reproductive rights, which I'm sure a lot of us are, is, is like the, the chipping, the potential chipping away of, of Roe v. Wade, right? Um, so, you know, and especially related to, obviously, um, if Amy Coney Barrett, um, you know, is pushed through, I think she has, of course, you know, Trump and his administration, they have um, vowed to appoint kind of pro-life Supreme uh, Court judges, they, they judges to the Supreme Court, and they definitely, I think that's like a driving factor uh, for the um, administration. And, um, you know, they, I think they want to dismantle all of the things that are in this list, but I think uh, reproductive rights are front and center. Um, and uh, Amy Coney Barrett has, you know, been on record saying that I think she she doesn't think that Roe v. Wade can necessarily be overturned, but it can be limited. And um, that's what really makes me nervous. Um, I know there's lots of cases kind of pending in lower courts that could come to the Supreme Court. Things like, you know, wild things like, you know, the burial of fetal tissue and, um, you know, bans on abortion for um, early weeks into pregnancy, pregnancy or parental um, notification of abortion, which we actually have in Illinois. Um, and so, you know, when I think about this particular fight, I, I, I kind of turn it back to access as well, which we talked about earlier today. Um, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade may not be overturned, but they are going to they are trying to make it harder for people to get access to basic health care that they need. Um, and that's what's really scary to me, um, you know, that those kind of this right will be chipped away at and, you know, we won't, um, people won't be able to get the care that they need. Um, even down to things like, you know, besides obviously um, the abortion conversation, things like birth control, um, or even just like just basic health care, right? Um, a lot could be um, really dismantled um, in this election. Um, so let's see, I know we got lots of questions in the chat that I will um, kind of maybe throw out as well to people. Um, let's see here. So all right, what steps will you take to ensure the reproductive health needs for women and girls are protected? Um, yeah, I think that's a really great question. That's from Beverly. I'm not sure if you're on Beverly, but thank you for um, your question. Um, a lot of things that um, I can kind of say that uh, Future of Choice has done is um, trying to um, elect people who we think that will protect reproductive health for women, um, for all people. Um, and then also, you know, like I mentioned, even in Illinois, we have the um, parental notice of abortion. Um, and that is going to be a goal um, to try to, after the election, try to um, dismantle in Illinois. So um, there have been quite a few um, different projects that we've worked on regarding kind of phone banking and supporting candidates, things like that. I don't know if anyone else from staff wants to talk about that a little more specifically. Hard to unmute. I forgot where the unmute was. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think foundationally, if you look at it from PPIA's perspective, it comes down to this, right? That people shouldn't have to make critical or healthcare decisions based on fear, and they cer certainly shouldn't have to do it at the behest of a politician or an elected official. Whether it is the type of birth control that you choose or whether or not you choose to have um, abortion care. And those are the rights that we have to protect. And so that's why it's so scary right now is we face this uncertainty 
with respect to filling um, Justice Ginsburg's, Ginsburg's seat. So foundationally, we have to protect that, that right. Um, you know, people depend on birth control to prevent unintended pregnancy, but they also depend on it to manage other healthcare conditions. And so it is a fundamental right. And we're lucky to be in Illinois, a state that is a haven, as you see other states around us, um, with uh, the bans being implemented and raised. You know, Illinois, because of the great work that shout out to the policy team for Planned Parenthood Illinois Action and all of their work that they have done to uh, introduce and protect um, the, the reproductive health care rights of people across the state. Because absent that, we wouldn't be able to be a haven. So I think it's just unconscionable that these questions even have to be raised in this day and age and unconscionable that our political climate right now can determine people's access to health care. And we're going to fight it. But I'll just say one more thing. We recognize that all of these topics that we're talking about are so connected. Reproductive health rights are economic rights, right? They, 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 they are, um, you know, workforce rights, right? They, they are domestic rights. They're all tied together. And so when we buoy one, we buoy the others. And with that, I'll pause. Yeah. <laughs> I think another another thing is important to realize, and I think Delmarie touched on this in the last topic about educating ourselves about certain things. A lot of people are are really worried about the Supreme Court overturning uh, precedent, and um, it, it's very difficult for the courts to then turn around and, and change their mind. There's a thing in the law called stare decisis, which uh, the judges are expected to essentially follow past precedent of what they've decided before. The more likely path for all of these things to become problematic is in Congress. Um, even once the Supreme Court makes a decision, the legislature can pass a law to overturn that decision as long as it doesn't interfere with the Constitution. And so um, these things will be very difficult for the court to necessarily address, but it's, it's certainly more important, or certainly as important to ensure that you know who your local representatives are, your state, your state and local representatives, your United States representatives, your United States senator, because those are the people that could actually um, have a much more direct impact to a lot of these issues that, that we're discussing today. Absolutely, Nicholas. And if I could just riff off that for a minute, that's so, such a critical point that you made, because very often people think about Roe v. Wade, for example, as just a blanket, it's gone, poof, right? But what we're seeing is a systematic chipping away of that at the state level. And so you're absolutely right. So thank you for raising that. So it may not be overnight like that, but we're already seeing it. And we're already seeing the, the ripple effects that that is having on other, other issues. And I really hope that the candidates address this tonight and not just in a blanket way, but in the systematic chipping away of these rights. You know, Paula, and it also underscores the importance of down ballot races. Yes. Nicholas mentioned Congress, and um, I, I agree that there may be an effort at some legislative changes if there is a significant shift in Congress. And so you really do have to vote all the way up and down the ballot and not just uh, for. Uh, issues that may be on the ballot. Uh, we have the fair tax in Illinois this time, but also for um, judges and other candidates. Yeah, and I think no. that that just, oh, go ahead, Paula. Uh, no, it was Adele Marie, but I was oh, going to say, but that's why it's so important. If you look at the poll that you we just did and the three top issues, which were reproductive rights and the Affordable Care Act and voting rights, those are three issues that are most at risk right now. And that is why uh, in 2016, 20% of those people who voted for Donald Trump and made up their minds in the last two weeks of the campaign said they did so based on the Supreme Court. 
Mm-hmm. So that was their driving motivation was the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court changing in terms of becoming more liberal. And most people thought if Hillary Clinton became the president, the court would become more liberal. And as we see, Donald Trump became the president and he's had three opportunities in three years. And that's incredible. And that's why it is so important to vote. And, and it's not just the Supreme Court. It's also... Right. The other federal courts, because if you look at the current nominee, she's coming from the Seventh Circuit, and she just got there, I believe, in 2017. Right. She was a Trump nominee in 2017. Yep. And he's and what ha- he's appointed over 200 federal judges in three years, and these are judges who will have an uh, impact on decision making and laws for decades and that's the like other judge, uh, jobs around and exactly that's and that's the other reason why they keep trying to get them younger and younger when ginsburg was chosen many people said she was too old at 60 and she was there 27 years so that's why they keep going younger and younger and younger so that they can have an impact for generations yeah, and I think this discussion really um, helps kind of answer one of the questions in the chat. And thank you for this question. Um, what are the steps that would need to be taken for Roe v. Wade to be overturned? Um, and what are we able to do now to help um, those rights regardless of the outcome of this election? So, um, you know, whoever um, so, asked that question. Yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. One of the things that I didn't mention in my introduction is I am the deputy city attorney for the city of Evanston, so I actually am a practicing lawyer. Um, Roe versus Wade is actually grounded in constitutional law. So the Supreme Court decided in that case that that uh, there was a constitutional right to uh, bodily integrity, which is going to be hard for any case to come up to the Supreme Court to strip away, which is why I said that it's more likely to happen in Congress. Um, it's more difficult right now because you have the, the two houses split. You have a Democratic um, House of Representatives, which believes that Roe versus Wade should be fi- should um, be the law of the land, and you have a Republican majority in the Senate, which you know do- doesn't necessarily have the the numbers to try and pass legislation to overturn that. Um, so it, it, the steps that would be, be necessary are are very difficult ones. You you need like the perfect case essentially in order to get up to the Supreme Court. And you have to convince the Supreme Court that there's no constitutional basis for this particular right, which they've already decided that there was. So they would have to essentially go against stare decisis and, and essentially change their mind altogether. Um, it's, not, it's, it's a lot different from, for example, the Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court has chipped away at, at various aspects of the Voting Rights Act. But the reason why they were able to chip away at it is because the evidence that was that was uh, used to support the Voting Rights the Voting Rights Act, uh, the things have changed. So the Supreme Court looked at the the evidence of uh, discrimination, so to speak, in those southern states, and decided that um, it, it wasn't the same as it was in the '60s. So we can toss a particular section of the of the Voting Rights Act. That's not the same here. It's it's specifically grounded in the Constitution. So it would be a lot more difficult for the Supreme Court to say uh, there's no longer a right to, to bodily integrity under the Constitution. And since we're talking about voting rights, this would be a good time for Rose to step in there and, uh, and take it for us. Yes, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful to be here with all of you and such an esteemed panel. Let me introduce myself. I am Rose Colasino, and I am the election security voting rights person for Indivisible Illinois. And uh, we have been at this pretty much since uh, 2016 when uh, Indivisible Illinois came about. Um, Indivisible Illinois was uh, launched right after the uh, 2016 election with our uh, national headquarters, the Indivisible Network. Give you a little more insight into us. We are in Illinois, about uh, 60 very active, busy groups, especially right now. And uh, Indivisible across the United States has approximately 6,000 people. So uh, yes, participatory democracy and uh, folks are incredibly busy right now. I want to tell you just a little bit more about us besides working on voting rights. We also do electoral work and we have been um, 
really since 2018, quite busy in the uh, swing states. We have been in Wisconsin, we have been in Michigan, but uh, quite a bit in uh, Wisconsin, I have to say. We think that it is very important to the uh, presidential and of course the uh, vice presidential race with our um, very fascinating debate that's going to come up this evening. Also want to plug the importance of down ballot races and we have an incredibly exciting candidate. I'm going to mess up her name, Danny B, Danny Brzezinski, and she's in um, Illinois 16. She is also, I have to say, an LGBTQ candidate. So um, before we launch the poll, I want to give you a little insight into where Indivisible Illinois has been with um, voting and it's been quite a ride, hasn't it? since um, everything that's in the news. And um, I have to say there is some uh, false narrative out there as well. I'll try to dispel some of that. But um, we did get involved actually way back when in 2016. I don't know if everybody realizes this, but um, as far as we know, Illinois was the um, only state that was hacked. Our uh, voting registration clearinghouse was hacked and it was off to the races since then. So um, starting at that time, we were really trying to impress upon people the importance of uh, hand-marked paper ballots and better audits in Illinois because uh, of course, paper can't be hacked. Things sort of went uh, upside down starting in uh, March. We all know what happened there. And um, starting in March, we really started to look very carefully at vote by mail. Of course, we've had vote by mail in um, Illinois for quite some time. A number of states have vote by mail, but um, we felt the need to expand it. And um, Indivisible Illinois was um, active. We had a seat at the table with the um, vote by mail expansion bill, which was signed um, by Governor Pritzker on June 16th. So as far as what it did, it um, opened the door, made things a little easier, sent out um, ballots automatically to a segment of us, also opened up um, November 3rd, as a um, state holiday. So we're gonna have more polling pay places, um, schools and um, other government facilities. So that's all excellent. But um, I just wanna take a couple of moments before we launch the poll to talk about why we have concentrated on vote by mail. I um, have done quite a bit of research. We have had the opportunity to talk to a number of election officials and not just in um, Chicago and suburban Cook, we're trying to talk to our um, activists and election officials in Peoria, in Champaign. As you know, we have a great uh, new clerk in Champaign by the name of um, Aaron Amons, the first African-American clerk, as far as I know, um, in that area. So it's been um, thrilling to get to know him. So um, what they are telling us is that the um, safest, most secure, accessible way to vote, despite, again, some of the things that you might be hearing in the news, is to vote by mail. So we encourage folks to um, vote by mail online because the um, election authorities are telling us they don't wanna deal with mounds and mounds and mounds of uh, paper. So if it is feasible for folks, we do ask them to vote online. I know there's some concern there. And um, I just wanna throw out um, a resource, hopefully. This is um, ad-free, this is free. Indivisible Illinois isn't gonna get any kind of cut on this. We have a website and it is um, www dot virus free voting illinois.org and what it is is one stop shopping it allows you to um, jump right in there go whatever jurisdiction you are from um, go right into that jurisdiction request your online ballot maybe while you're there sign up to be a poll worker i understand we're uh, making some inroads i'm not uh, quite as concerned as i was a while ago but um, i am still concerned that we do have enough poll workers so we can open up the um, polls for everybody that wants to vote in person. And um, why, again, about um, vote by mail? Because we feel that the um, polls should be reserved for voters with disabilities, for um, people with non-English speaking skills, and people with uh, last minute emergencies. So um, happy to entertain any questions about that. I would love, love, love to hear what um, plans people have. I'm actually giving a presentation this evening and the focus of the presentation is making a plan. What is your plan? Because um, here we go, the poll is up now, but uh, we really need to start thinking about this now. As I said, we feel very comfortable that um, mail-in balloting is safe up until October the 20th. After October the um, 20th, we um, encourage everybody to vote safely early and um, hopefully not wait until November the 3rd. 
So um, great, the poll is up. So the question is, what is your plan to vote? If you already voted, tell us how you voted and um, let's see what's happening here. In person, yes. Understand, I do hear that quite a bit in person at early voting sites. And um, with that, as you are voting, I just want to call out some um, information about early voting sites. Again, we have 108 jurisdictions in um, Illinois, so can't give information all of it, although you can go to that website I pitched earlier. And um, in Chicago, early voting in mass starts on October the 14th. I am a Chicago voter. I have voted by mail. I don't know if you can see my sticker. I have my sticker, I'm really <laughs> excited. My friend, um, the leader of Indivisible Illinois is on this call, Lenny Mana Hoppenworth. We uh, got on a Facebook Live and we voted together and it was a lot of fun. So if that's something that you wanna do, I encourage you to do this because it's all about not just us voting, encouraging everybody we know to vote as well. So it looks like uh, in-person early voting is um, picking up some steam. And with that, I want to shout out that um, October the 19th is the date that um, suburban Cook County opens up in mass. And there's about 50 polling places in um, Chicago. There's about 50 polling places in um, suburban Cook. With that, I want to say some of you might have seen uh, our former mayor, Rahm Emanuel, voted on um, October the 1st. So for Chicago, there is that a lot of you are familiar with probably the super sites, October the 1st, and I believe there's going to be also some um, limited voting in um, suburban Cook starting the 9th, if not um, earlier. Right. Thank you, Rose. I have a, a, a question, um, actually, uh, a thought and a question. So, um, you know, we, our Planned Parenthood of Illinois Action Team has been doing a great job getting the word out about the importance of having a plan to vote right? Including online voting. And we'll also include a link towards the end of this. And the more that I think about uh, the, a thread in this conversation of not only the vice presidential race or the president race, but also the downstate, I want to make sure that people know that we do have a list of candidates that PPIA has endorsed, and they can find that on um, the Planned Parenthood Illinois Action site. A question for, for you, Karen, what are you hearing from your constituents at the Urban League and all of the people that you serve with respect to their voting plans? Are they weighing in person versus, you know, uh, mailing it in? You know, um, a lot depends on the person's age. Some of our older, um, clients are sending in their ballots. Uh, they're concerned about the potential to contract uh, COVID and the exposure that may be at the polling place. Others who have been out and about more are saying, you know, just like I go to the grocery store, this is so important. Uh, I'm going to uh, vote in person. Uh, I may vote early to just uh, minimize that potential, but I am still going to vote in person. Uh, I think that people still have a concern about the mail. And certainly we have seen that in Chicago. Uh, we have seen our mail be delayed, uh, get held up. Uh, in fact, we had that problem at the league and went to the local uh, post office and they just said, hey, you know what, we are swamped, we're inundated, we're trying to get better. It's improved a bit, but there's still a concern that we have our voice heard. And so that's why we are working. In fact, we just posted a voter guide on our website, uh, shyul.org, that encourages people to, one, know the candidates, know the issues, and then create a voting plan. Yeah, that's really, really important um, to do that. And I think, you know, I'm so grateful for, for all of you and your work and the fact that there are so many res resources to where people can turn for that information. So thanks for lifting that up, Rose. Of course. And, and, and Paula, there was um, a question in the chat about those down ballot and local election races that we should be paying attention to that actually could be key in some of the issues we've discussed today. Um, two of those races, uh, only because they are near and dear to my heart, are the state's attorney's race, as well as the judges that are on the ballot. 
Uh, so shameless pl plug with respect to the judges, there's a website, voteforjudges.org. It is a compilation of the ratings by the Alliance of Bar Associations, which is about 13 bar associations that get together and evaluate um, judicial candidates, whether they be for uh, first time election or if they're up, um, as many judges in this particular race are up for retention this year. And so you can go there and look at those, um, those, those ratings to determine who, who the judges are that you should uh, vote in favor of. But let's not forget the state's attorney's race um, where we have a state's attorney here in Cook County that actually is trying to uh, seek justice, which right. as a former prosecutor myself, that was what we were trained to do. It wasn't about convictions, it was about seeking judges justice. And I think for the first time in some time, we actually have one in office that does exactly that. And I remember re recently reading a story um, where she dismissed some charges because they, they were not, uh, the evidence was insufficient, um, mm -hmm. which is exactly what she's supposed to do, but it was a heinous crime. And so right. certainly there would have been a lot of pressure for her to pursue that case and try and get a conviction, but she did the right thing. So right. those, that's definitely something that's important. Very important. And Planned Parenthood Illinois Action, was so proud to endorse Kim Fox in that race. So um, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, that was an endorsement that made everybody smile. And you know, uh, I just want to add, a lot of times people uh, skip the judges or skip certain uh, offices uh, because they don't know the candidates or aren't familiar, but the resource that Nicholas just gave uh, takes all of that away because you have an opportunity to see who an alliance, a group, 13 bar associations have uh, evaluated and come up with um, the indicia of whether or not they should or should not be supported. And, and I think that's a reliable source. Anytime you have 13 that have come together. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I'm so happy, everybody, that we're putting all of the links that are being mentioned in the chat. And then we'll look at including some of that in the follow-up that's going to be sent around. Because I just, part of my fear is, and particularly with, you know, I have a, a daughter who's 22 and then a, a son who's not yet old enough to vote, but really stressing the importance that it is not just the for the president and the vice president, but it is down ballot as well. And I sort of feel this pressure. There's not a lot of time to get those who are not up to speed, up to speed. And our teams individually are doing so much work to raise that up. But I'm so excited by this conversation because think of what we can do collectively, even throughout the rest of this election season, but also, also beyond. But also, Paula, uh, using us as a resource as well, because mm -hmm. all of our organizations, we have Facebook pages and we have websites and, and a lot of this information is on our individual yes. uh, websites and Facebook pages. So we're, we're also a resource because in some cases we have done the work for you or are doing the work for you so that uh, we get the correct information out there and that is not just frivolous information or people talking off the top of their heads and with no uh, scientific information behind it. So we wanna make sure that our listening public and viewing public uh, knows that they can come to us as well. I wanna take this time to uh, just wrap up my segment and then hand it over to uh, Delmarie Cobb to wrap up the event. And uh, I do wanna say one last thing about uh, voting. I wanna amplify a little more secure drop boxes. So um, those secure drop boxes will be available at uh, all early voting sites. And also there is a 24 uh, hour, hour one for Chicago at uh, 69 West Washington. So that's my uh, plug for Dropboxes. And again, um, really happy and um, honored to be here with all of you. And I now turn it over to Delmarie Cobb. And thank you, Rose. I appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for a great lunch and learn panel discussion. I want to thank our hosts, Planned Parenthood Illinois Action and the Chicago Urban League, and of course myself, uh, Ida's Legacy. 
And wherever you are tonight, make sure you stop to watch the only vice presidential debate of the campaign. Much is being said about the importance of these two vice presidential candidates, given the ages of their running mates. The most watched vice presidential debate so far was between Democrat Joe Biden and Republican Sarah Palin in 2008. An estimated 70 million viewers tuned in to see the matchup. Uh, the debate tonight is expected to draw an even larger viewership. All of the networks are carrying the de debate, so there's absolutely no excuses for not seeing it. And let's do everything we can to help elevate the issues we care about and to take action after the debate to make a difference in the upcoming election. We have less than a month. You'll be receiving an email later today with some suggested actions, and many of them you heard already, and we're going to make sure that you actually receive them from us. And again, we thank you for joining us, and we want you to have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.